Uh, I was not prepared to speak for 25 minutes. <laughs> they say that 15 minutes. I'm trying to add something to my paper, but I'm not so confident with my English. So now we are going to see what, what I can do. Uh, my paper is the ideal second part of Professor Cooper pa Cooperman paper because I will speak to you about the same topics but just a uh, few decades later well, after the institution of the ghetto. As it is uh, well known, in 1555 Pope Paul IV set up the ghettos in the church state. The papal bull, cum nemis absurdum, it's so, uh, cum nemis absurdum, established various restrictions in order to separate definitely Jews from Christians in the papal state. Those restrictions hit any aspect of daily life and included a lot of issues concerning jobs and professions. Today, I don't want to recall these families this famous list of forbidden activities, but I prefer to focus on the social and economic spaces that the Jews were able to find and to exploit, even in this hard situation. Renowned schoolers in Italy has been investigated, are being investigated in topics about the anti-Jewish politics of the so-called counter-reformation in Italy, such as Giacomo Tudeschini, Adriano Prosperi, and Marina Caffiero. So I prefer to focus to on another and insider point of view. One of the questions less investigated by Italian historiography concerns the tools that Jews elaborated to face this challenge along the three century of the ghetto times. How did the Jews organize themselves to survive the proselytism, the anti-Jewish anti politics made up, set up by the church to convert them? During the three century of the ghetto time, important transformation occurred in any field of Jewish life, from institutional and economic aspects, as Professor Cooperman just shows us, to religious issues and to social and economic matters. I will analyze, for today, my paper will investigate it as a case study and from this perspective of surviving, the transformation of pure to Jewish money lending in Rome during the second half of the 16th century. Since the foundation of the gate, it was in fact the only one prestigious profession to be legal for the Jews until 1682 when another pope, Innocenzo XI, ordered to close all the Hebrew banks of the state. I will analyze the development of Jewish money lending in the first decades of the ghetto era, starting from this point. Once it is established that this specific activity was still permitted, how did the Jewish money lending change in this period? How did it survive for more than one century, the year of discrimination, just under the Pope's roof? I used, thanks to a cross-checking uh, between Jews and Christian sources, something like Professor Cooperman showed you before, it is possible to give some answer to these questions. I used the famous Jewish notarial act records of Rome as a fil rouge to other archival sources in Christian records. Those records keep insider interior memory of any activity practiced by Roman Jews, and for this, in strict connection with Christian sources, they could permit to identify interesting research themes still unexplored. Today I will focus on two agreements on two kinds of agreements managed inside the Jewish society, about, uh, inside, inside Jewish society, but in strictly connection with Christian society. It's impossible to understand what happened in Jewish society using only Jewish sources. But at the same time, it's impossible to understand what's happened in Jewish society using only Christian sources. The problem we have in Rome is that we have too many sources. We have Jews everywhere. We can find Jews in Christian notaries, and you must remember that we are at the same moment 30 different Christian notar notaries operating in Rome. So who is the, Jew, the, the right notary to look for? 
We have Christian notaries, we have Jews notaries, we have public sources, such as the records of the Cardinal Camerlengo, but also any records made in the papal office. And there are many papal offices contemporary, and all these offices were contemporary. So we must we need to understand where to go. And we can use the Jewish notarial acts as a fil rouge to understand where to go. And this is what I made for this paper. I checked in the Jewish notarial acts and I realized that we have two kinds of agreements that we never expect to have. And those concern, first, the management of contracts made previously with, the notarial, with Christian notaries and with Christian hospitals between Jewish bankers on one side and managers of the Christian hospitals on the other side. And we have this information in the Christian sources. But we have the second part of the story in the Jewish notarial acts about the management of this contract among the Jewish society made with the Jewish notaries in a uh, respecting at the same time the Alpi Alaha, they say, but it's not so Alpi Alaha, it's Karov Alaha on one side, and the question regarding the common law operating in Rome at that period. If we check this, and another question concerning the use of public spaces in Rome, the Jews were allowed to sell their items, their old items, in the public market of the town. The public market of the town were organized as every other public market in a European town at the moment, as Fernand Brodel showed us in his renowned books. So the authority rent spaces, they uh, called them posti di mercato, sites in the market, to people. And those people, Jewish people, run sub-rent them to other Jewish people, dividing them into different gazagot. It is the same that we know for houses in the ghetto. And it works still in the outside of the ghetto, in the public spaces. It's very important because if you, do, if you do, don't have a space where to sell your, market, your items, you couldn't sell it. And it works uh, uh, both, in the inter, both in the town, in the public markets, but both in the ferry outside the town, just like as the famous fairy of Fafa, but not only this. So I heard that we can understand something about the, the presence of Jewish in Christian society only if we select the right sources, and we can select the right sources only if we check at the same time Jewish sources and Christian sources. And I'm going, I'm here to, to, to present you a case study and an example of this. First of all, it's important for my argument today, Jewish money lending room in the first times of the ghetto area, to clarify who is a Jewish banker in Rome in this time. Since the founding of Jewish Bank in Rome in 1521, as Professor Cooperman said just before, the governance of Jewish money lending was attributed to the Cardinal Camerlengo. The Cardinal Camerlengo was the most important magistrate of the church state, with jurisdiction over any secular issues of the state. It's important to remind that at this moment, the most important magistrate in the church state were, of course, the Pope, on one hand, the Cardinal Camerlengo, on the other hand, the Cardinals involved with Inquisition. And the Jews were able to negotiate their position with all these authorities. If they had a problem with the Inquisition, they, can, they could go to the Cardinal Camerlengo. If they had a problem with Cardinal Camerlengo or Cardinal Vicario in Rome, they could go to the Inquisition. And it's very interesting, this contrast between Christian, Christian authorities to understand how it's possible for example, for those to go outside of the ghetto. They could manage their permission to go outside of the ghetto with Cardinal Camerlengo, and the Inquisition say that it's not so correct, but the Inquisition could do anything to stop this movement. According to the chapters about Jewish money lending in Rome, in, uh, uh, established in 1521, it was necessary to be assigned with a papal loan license 
in order to be considered a real Jewish banker. In theory, this system of high-ranking acknowledgement on one side should have a blocked outsider to access the profession, as the case of David S. shows. while on the other one should have ensured to the Pope full control over this important matter. Reality was different, and if the renewal of learning lessons was rather unusual, there was another and faster way to be regarded as a banker, even in absence of the papal permit. This is in the second half of the century, of course. As magistrate in charge for Hebrew banking, it was the Cardinal Camerlengo who used to sign every important, a very important document called Inhibitio Ratione Fenoris, thanks to which the owner of the permit was protected against the authority of any other court of the Papal State. These inhibitions were grant Ratione Fenoris, it means for money lending business. Sometimes they were valid without tint time limits, others for three, four, or five years, and were usually extended to the owner, his family members, and employees. Moreover, those inhibitions allowed them to not only be judged solely by the court of the Chamberlain, but also to make use of his authority against their own debtors. The relevance of these documents is unquestionable, and in fact, Jewish bankers, both with the papal license and without his, paid attention to have them regularly confirmed. The inhibition was linked to the Chamberlain that had granted it, and for this reason, we find in the records of the Camerlengo renewals drawn one after the other for pages and pages in correspondence to any turnover in this office. It is important to remind that, on one hand, this permits marked an intermediate stage of professional career, careers that began years before and that were developed in multiple ways, while, on the other hand, they contributed to enlarge the group of the money lenders of the Jewish community. If it is possible that the banker wasn't probably a banker, this means that some people could become bankers even without Papa lessons. Especially for those who didn't belong to family of bankers, there were other possibilities to enter this most group, all related to the clever use of any business file still allowed to the Jews in the, in the ghetto time. Despite the special protection granted by the Chamberlain, moreover, the effects of the anti-Jewish policy assailed the Jewish bankers too. To reinforce business, even the family of moneylenders began to focus on secondary activities, diversifying their investment beyond the bank activity. This caused two different consequences. On one hand, it helped some wealthy family to maintain established position of social and economic prominence. On the other one, it facilitated social climbing by outsiders. Among these secondary business, the first one concerned the monopoly agreement with some of the most important room hospital hospitals for the provision of used clothes. Used clothes. As you know, used clothes are not so poor items. In the economy of, uh, the, of, ans of our early modern town, used clothes are an essential tool of the economy. Everything was used. We have not a lot of items made as new. We have a continual trade of old clothes. And the Jews were able to shorten, to um, guarantee to them one of the most important and one of the most of the biggest way to find old clothes, the hospitals. <coughs> The provision was secured for a long period of time, usually nine years, through an agreement between Jewish companies created for that purpose and some of the major hospitals of the town. We found this agreement in the registers, in the records of the hospitals uh, written by Christian Notaris. The contracts established, established that the hospital's administrators could sell all these packages, the fardelli the quoted in the, in the contract, only to the Jews, and that the Jews could not refuse to buy them. Normally, the agreement required quarterly payments for the collection of packages, the rent of a little hut inside the hospital, and the willingness 
to solve fast any problems, such as, for example, the growing amount of packages as a consequence of a growing death rate in case of pestilence. It was inevitable that those managers asked current assets guarantees to their Jewish counterparts, and that therefore they preferred to deal exclusively with Jewish people wealthy and well known. In another world, Christian hospital managers wanted to make business only with the trusted Jews on the basis of previous confidence. The signature of the counter was not the end of the story. Once the agreement was validated, suddenly it took new life in the ghetto, in the office of the Jewish notaries, where Jewish entrepreneurs apportioned dues by, div by dividing the risk of with other Jewish Americans who would never have been able to enjoy the confidence of Christian counterparts for their own. Their own. Doing so, however, helped some other Jewish Americans to enter into this kind of business, at the beginning as a collaborator and later as a real partner. At the end of a successful career, it was again the Chamberlain to certify a successful path through the granting of the inhibitio, also to those who, up to that time, had little to do with the real bank activity. There was another important tool to improve one's career, and it was related, as I said before, to places in Rome markets where Jews could set up their stands. Authorities rent out those places to dealers, including the Jews in market zone reserved to them. Undoubtedly, for Jews, the ownership of a marketplace constituted a good value and an important element to determine personal assets. Just as for homes and rooms in the ghetto area, Gazakult, the title of ownership of marketplace, could be sold, rent, divided into shares and become part of dowry. As in the previous case of companies engaged with hospitals, those Gazakot represented an area of investment for Jewish bankers who, personally or subletting them to others, often young members of their own family, used the same space to trade both money and all objects. Moreover, it's important to underline that even in disguise, the system to rule inside the ghetto with the Jewish law, a contract senior outside it with Christian law, worked very well. A study on personal career showed that both these secondary activities could lead to the segment of one inhibitio. This <coughs> happy hand was not predicted, it's just a possibility. As all the sources shows very, show very well, those stories are family stories, in which any member of a family played a role. Sometime in the hospital business, someone else in the marketplace activity, some other in more different ways, from the marriage market to the government of the Jewish community. This process of social acknowledgement was developed along many stages and various tools, at what time inside and outside the Jewish society. Any personal success achieved in the public scene and its relation with Christian counterpart was the result of a confidence grown up in the Jewish, society, in the Jewish side and vice versa. It was a circular movement that was able to break down the walls of the ghetto at individual level. The most important contact between zone between Jews and Christian in this case was the Cardinal Camerlengo, where the same Jews went both to renewal their inhibitions and to manage fiscal issues in the name of Rome Jewish communities, at one time as bankers, at the other one as community leaders. It was the Chamberlain again that seen permission to go in and out from the ghetto to collect taxes, taxes in all, uh, along all Italy in the name of, of Jewish community of Rome. To make, it was the Chamberlain again that seen permission to make business abroad. To, ex, uh, to attend medicine faculty in, in Padova and Ferrara, and for any other hints, such as, for example, to free Jewish slaves found in the Italian port of Ancona, uh, Livorno, Naples, and Venice. Those liaisons were interlaced through different tools, and we find them in any, in any kind of sources. They could be developed so that various and extraordinary social mobility was the result of such a big range of possibility at the beginning of the ghetto time. Special restrictions set for them forced the Jews, Jews to grow up new roads that produced an expected child. 
chance for Jewish money lender, and this is my conclusion. This is just an example of a social history still larger and explored by Italian historical research about Jewish in early modern Italy. It was not just an era of religious discrimination. It was a period of big challenges for Jewish people who were able to survive this violent Christian proselytism in various ways. The transformation invested cultural, economical, and social aspects of which it will be important to investigate in the future. Thank you.